Yeah, I usually get introduced as Meredith's husband. So you've got my better half on the front end. Hopefully I can keep up with that. Um, man, it's a, it's a real honor to be with you guys, especially uh, hearing you guys just had 25-year anniversary. Um, Steve and Cindy just, man, I really want to honor you guys. I didn't grow up in the church, but to see mothers and fathers have legacy and longevity and fruitfulness, it's really encouraging to me, you know, so I just want to honor you guys. And I, if you don't mind, I just want to pray for you guys as well right now. Lord, I just thank you uh, for this house. Um, Lord, for Steve and Cindy Witt and their faithfulness and their sacrifice to lay down their lives uh, for your bride, for your purposes in this city, in this region. Thank you for this body, Lord. And I know this body is entering into a new season after 25 years, into a new season of advancement. And, uh, and so, Lord, I just pray for that, that faith and the courage to step into the fullness of all that you've called them to, just a new level of, of radical love for their, their community and their, and their, and yeah, Lord, that you just thrust them into, I love what Steve was talking about, thrust them into their legacy. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Um, you know, when Steve was uh, talking on Friday night, what a powerful, you guys, anybody here Friday night for the prophetic? It was really powerful. Um, Steve was, he said something about uh, how God is bringing you onto the field in this season. And it really just stuck with me because I really feel like we're in one of those advancing seasons. Like when the enemy is, is telling everybody to pull back and hide and retreat, you know that's when it's really time to advance in God's kingdom because it's, it's kind of the, in, kingdom's kind of upside down, right? Kind of upside down. So I want to take... Uh, take us back a little bit. I want to share a little bit of our story because the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy and then to help us look forward. Um, as Jerry told you, uh, we were at the Upper Room for about seven years. We pioneered uh, the Upper Room worship music stuff and then I was executive pastor for about five years. And in 2017, if you guys don't mind, I'm just going to get raw and real, real fast. <laughs> I don't have a lot of time, but um, in 2017, I, I went with a buddy of mine, Sean Foyt. We went to northern Iraq to work in refugee camps. It was when Mosul was being overrun by ISIS. ISIS was invading the area, and there was just, just massive refugee camps of 30,000, 70,000, 15,000, 20,000. We went there to bring, you know, diapers and food and stuff for the, for, for the people that were suffering there. And it was, I heard some of the most traumatic stories of my life that I'd ever heard ever experienced. Came back just kind of carrying that. I'm a feeler, kind of prophetic guy, just kind of carrying the weight of that. And not too long right after that, uh, my brother committed suicide. Most devastating thing that ever happened to me by far. And he just was really a casualty of war, really a really difficult, difficult time. Uh, not too long right after that, about a month later, our children's minister, we had a 60-year-old children's minister. Not many Men that old are still children's minister. They usually graduate. He was a beautiful man, had beat cancer supernaturally out of his body one year. We had this healing time, gone. A year later, comes back in his body, ravages through him, he passes away. It was devastating. Right after that, I dealt with this. I had this crazy uh, betrayal happen in my life. Then my grandmother passes away. A week later, a good friend of mine passes away. And so it was like, bang, 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 bang. And uh, anybody ever follow God and you're like, this, this doesn't seem like it's turning out the way I thought it was going to turn out? <laughs> like we can all raise our hands in that one, right? And I just got to the point where I, I was like, man, I need a sabbatical. I need to pull back. And Michael Miller was like, man, go, do it. You know? And I just began to seek the Lord you know, and to go back and review the prophetic words over my life, what God was speaking. And I asked him this one specific question. I would encourage you guys to ask God this question over your life. But it's, what's the big thing that you want to accomplish through my life? What do you want to accomplish through my life? Is what I asked him. And as I was reviewing the prophetic words and our prophetic history and what God had done in our lives, I felt like he said three things. I felt like he said, I want my stories to be told in the earth. I want people to see the heart of my son. And then the third thing was for my sons to possess the gates of the enemy, which is one of the promises given to Abraham, the father of our faith, so it's our promise too. But immediately I thought of the entertainment media complex. Because when the world looks at the church, they see it through the media's eyes, right? They see our brokenness, our fallen nature. They see judgmental, hypocritical, boring, all these things. They don't see the heart and the beauty of who Jesus is. And I felt like he said it was time for his kids to go back and, and to take that space 
of the art, art entertainment media complex, right? And so in faith, I felt like I was, I was, I w- I was called to do this, but I'm like working in a church, right? And, but I felt like I was supposed to do it specifically in the area of making films. And my wife and I, through counsel and prophetic, we take this leap of faith, stepping away from my job with literally nothing in front of me. She laid down up room music with literally nothing in front of us. The scariest, hardest decision I've ever made in my entire life, but our passionate desire is to follow Jesus. We just want to follow Jesus. And it was clear, it was so clear that he was calling us out, right? And so we step out, and about a month later, I met some guys that were uh, from Hollywood, believers that had been in the Paramount film system, um, other producers of big TV shows, and they wanted to go create God's studio in Georgia, but put worship at the center of it. And I was like, that sounds like my jam, you know? I was like, because I've always looked at the tabernacle of David in the center of in the center of culture to have worship and prayer and let all creative ideas flow from that and then send it out into culture to transform the culture, right? So we ended up doing that for about a year and a half and then um, our company made a film and then we were shifting kind of structure and moving from Thomasville, Georgia up to Atlanta and our house wasn't ready yet. And this was in the middle of 2020. So we, when our house wasn't ready, we went down to Tampa because I have family down in Tampa, okay? And when we were down there, it's like middle of pandemic and all of a sudden, my crazy friend comes to town, Sean Foyt, and he's doing this thing called Let Us Worship. And he's doing it one in Tampa. And I was like, hey, bro, we're in Tampa. He's like, you're there? Get Meredith to lead a worship. Get a band. We're going to do this thing. And I was like, all right, you know, let's go. And so it was this outdoor event, and it was on September 18th. And that day is significant because it was my brother's birthday. And my brother was from Tampa. And so I went, before the event, I went over to my parents' house, my dad and my stepmom, and it's a day of just grieving for them. I brought them flowers, you know, and it's an emotional day. And, and when I was praying, I felt like the Lord said, it's time to plunder hell on your brother's behalf. And I was like, okay, what does that mean? <laughs> and so I go to the event, and the first thing Sean starts talking about was when the government of California locked down the churches and told them they couldn't sing. They went to the Golden Gate Bridge and worshiped outside. And there was all these police there patrolling But they weren't there because of them. They were there because there were so many people committing suicides in the midst of the pandemic because of the lockdowns. They were on suicide patrol. And when he started off the event with that, I knew I was going to have to share, you know. And we do altar calls. People are getting baptized. It was this powerful time. Then he goes, do you have anything? And I said, sure, I'm going to share. And so I get up and I, and I started to, and I looked around and I was like, man, this is Tampa Bay. It's like everything about Tampa is like pirates and buccaneers and and I said, you know, this is, this is the land of pirates. And I said, you know, there's a godly version of that thing where Jesus went into hell and he took back the keys of death in Hades and he plundered hell. And I said, we're going to plunder hell today. And I started to share the story of my brother and how he was from Tampa. And I said, look, I don't want to lose any more brothers and sisters. I don't want to lose any more brothers and sisters. If you're struggling with this, I want you to come down now. I'm going to give you the biggest hug you ever experienced in your life. I don't even know what I was saying. I was like, just come. And all these men come rushing to the front, you know, and we're breaking every kind of COVID protocol, just like hugging each other, loving each other, snot dripping. And it was this powerful moment where these men were getting set free from suicide and depression. And this video goes viral around the world and people are emailing in saying, I'm feeling freedom from suicide, depression. And And I saw this moment how God took something so horrific and flipped the script and it became a weapon then to plunder hell, right? And so we just, we were still in between, so we just decided to jump and go city to city with him. We just were going all across the country and was seeing the power of God show up in such profound ways that I hadn't seen in America. I'd only seen it on the mission field. But I think because of the lockdowns and the depression and how people were so closed off, there was this longing for God and longing for connection and community and and real presence of God. And... During this time, uh, Showtime and Vice were approaching Sean about telling his story. But I knew if they told this story, they were going to tell it in a way that was not the kingdom version. It wasn't God's version of the story. And I said, man, let me tell this story. So we start talking, and, and, and so we start to put together this documentary film on the story. And I've got a teaser. Are you guys okay if I show you a little teaser? Okay, so here, I'm going to give you a little inside baseball. Here's my strategy, okay? Because I want the world to see this. The church is going to see it, but how do we get the world to click on this? Okay, if it's on Netflix or or, uh, Amazon Prime and you see Let Us Worship and you're an unbeliever, you think they're going to click on that? Ain't going to happen. So during this whole season, 
uh, there was a Rolling Stone article that came out on Sean Foyt. It was all on the cover, and it said, Jesus Christ, super spreader. And I was like, I like that name. So I was like, why don't we call this thing super spreader? Because if you're flipping through that, oh, let's click on that. And then we're going to tell the story from the media and the skeptic's perspective. We're interviewing people who are against it and who are for it. So we're telling both sides of the story. And once all the skeptic's walls are down, then we're going to insert Jesus in the power of God and what God is doing. So Jesus will show up. All right. If you don't mind playing it real quick. Here we go. just got news from a very viable source that in 20 minutes, Gavin Newsom, the governor of California, is going to shut down all New York church, church meetings this week. Singing, Singing has, has been banned at all church services in California. This is a new statewide action, uh, effective today. And I heard that, I was like, <laughs> okay, it's on. Possible super spreader concert. They are packed in front of that stage, mostly maskless. John Ford, let us worship. It's a super spreader. You are not welcome. Let's go. Of course, you guys know what we're gonna do. We're not gonna back down. Let's go. Woo! There was massive pushback. If Jesus were here right now, he absolutely would wear a mask. This is our 98th city that we've been to. You're going to come in to pray with people and take the chance of giving them that play, really. It's one of the worst feelings as a human being to feel misunderstood. And we were just completely being misunderstood at this point. How do you feel right now? We face resistance in Portland, we face resistance in Seattle, we face resistance in Chicago. If people aren't courageous and take a stand for what they believe in, we're in trouble. Courage is taught when you see it. You can't really teach it as principle. You have to see it modeled. The church has got to take a stand. We cannot be cowered and pushed around anymore. There's a pandemic. There's a plague. Here's a move of God that's going to change America. Pray with me, church! This is the next great awakening. This is what we've been praying for. You know how valuable your life is? This guy is probably responsible for hundreds of deaths. This is the season where we need to actually open our mouths and worship. What people like Sean are saying about what God says, oftentimes is false. You are not a Christian! Oh, I'm here! Give me life! Light overcomes darkness every day! Stay tuned, we'll come to you soon. It's emotional watching that. Just to see what God is doing in, in the power of God. Because it's, it's a challenging season, right? But God has never stopped moving in the midst of wars, in the midst of plagues or whatever, right? There's, there's people that need Jesus. And uh, yeah, it's, it's one of these stories that touches on every major narrative of 2020. Whether it's racial reconciliation and going to George Floyd. Whether it's Antifa members coming to Jesus. Whether it's Satan worshipers coming to Jesus. I mean, it was just... It was just unbelievable to see what happened. And so I just feel like God has given us this tool to get into people's homes and onto their phones and then for them to see and encounter the real love of Jesus. I had, uh, I had the privilege of meeting with uh, George Barna. Uh, anybody know, you guys know who George Barna is? He's done more statistics on church trends and then he gets paid to do statistics, right? And I have had this theory um, about the power of, of media because as a kid, I know this sounds funny, but as a kid, when I grew up, my dream was to be in the mafia. 
It truly was. I was a 90s kid and I grew up watching all these gangster films, listening to gangster rap, and those were the sermons that discipled me. They were. And what I saw, I saw these men who were willing to die for each other in these films. And I came from a broken home and I was like, man, I, I long for love like that. That looks like unconditional love, you know. And when I came to Christ, I, Jesus said greater love is than the, no one than this. The one lays down his life for his friends, right? And so it was just this, this version of love, a twisted version of it that, that, I, that I didn't experience, but I saw through the media and the films and the music that I, that I watched and listened to. And so I knew the power of that to grab a hold of a heart like mine for kids that may not step foot in a church. And so I met with Barn and I said, hey, have you ever done any like research statistics on what transforms culture in America? He goes, oh, absolutely. He goes, I've done statistics. We have got, we've identified three tiers of cultural influence. And could you put up this chart? Three tiers of cultural influence, top tier being most significant, middle tier, bottom tier. But in the top tier, there's, he's identified seven things. Five out of those seven for the most influential in the transformation of American culture are media related. Movies, TV, music, books, social media, and then you got laws and you have family and parents. And my heart is to get the church into this space, which a lot of churches are beginning to move that way. I saw that there's a heart for this here. You got the music, media, and even Steve said, I heard him say that there's a, it's a, there's a massive time of renaissance in Ohio, right? He said that, I think he's speaking to that prophetically. And what is the Renaissance? The Renaissance is a revival of art and literature. It means rebirth, revival of art and literature. Because there's something about media. I mean, we're spending upwards of 11 hours a day in front of screens right now, according to Nielsen ratings. And you become what you behold, right? So we have to be in front of people, in front of their eyes. But what's interesting about this region because for whatever reason, I was traveling this year and I never buy books in the airport, but I picked up this book called The Pioneers by David McCullough. Anybody read the book or seen the book? Well, it's about Ohio. You th I think y'all would. I had no idea the whole book is about Ohio. It was about a pastor named Manasseh Cutler who went to uh, the United States government and petitioned them to start a company called the Ohio Land Company and to pioneer and settle this whole region. It was a pastor. He had a vision for this region, for it to be a free place where there's no slaves, free education, and freedom of religion. He had a vision for it. And these people started moving. It created what's, what was called Ohio fever. Everybody wanted to come to this place. This was the place of pioneers. And hearing Steve talk about it the other day, the Wright brothers, like all these NASA, like this is the place of pioneers. You guys are pioneers. It's who you are. That's why Steve said it's time to get on the field, right? And pioneers, when they're going, they're, they're the explorers, they're called to go into new places. They're called to possess promised lands. To do that, they have to have vision, which comes by faith. Faith comes by hearing, hearing the word of God, right? Faith is the assurance of what you hope for, something in the future. But to apprehend and access that, you have to take courage. You need courageous leaders. You need courageous hearts to step into it. And the irony of that, this, this past year, I think the most famous phrase that I heard, uh, and I've traveled in the last two years more than I'd ever have before in my life, and every time I would travel, everybody would go, Michael, be safe out there. Be safe out there. Where are you going? You're gonna fly? Be safe out there. Hey, Michael, be safe out there. And I started thinking about that phrase, and I realized there is no command in the Bible that says be safe. <laughs> it's not in there. I mean, could you imagine, like, when God is saying be courageous, it's because it's time to move forward, right? Could you imagine, he's like, it's like Joshua and Caleb, it's time to enter the promised land. He's like, Joshua and Caleb, I've got this land for you. It's your promised land. It's filled with milk and honey. But look, there's going to be some giants you're going to have to face. You're going to have to take down these giants in your promised land. Be safe out there. <laughs> be safe out there. It's not there. Right? When it's time to get on the field, or when it's time to advance, it's a time that you need courage. He says, be strong and courageous, right? And so when I was, I felt like the Lord said, Michael, my body needs courage. My body needs courage. This is a time when my body needs courage. 
And I was seeing that as we were going through the Let Us Worship thing, I was seeing the body strengthened and encouraged through that process. And, and right around last December, I, was watching, I decided to watch a movie with my kids called Back to the Future. Who's not seen Back to the Future? What? Four, three or four of y'all. Y'all gotta go watch this, okay? So classic movie. What if I told you this was a Christian film? You wouldn't believe me, right? But what if it is? The Lord began to speak to me about this film as I was watching it with my kids. And he said, McFly, remember McFly, McFly. I felt like the Lord said, McFly is the church. And so his son, Marty, is Michael J. Fox, right? And then he's got the other character on the opposite is Biff, the guy that intimidates him, right? And so McFly is actually the main character of the film. And when Marty goes back to the future, right? This is really interesting. Right when he goes back, to, when he, sorry, he goes back into the past, the first place he walks into is a diner. And the first thing that, that, that the camera turns to is this clock and on the wall it says high praises. It's really odd. You're like, why are they focusing on high praises? And then immediately the guy behind the counter looks at Marty and goes, hey, why are you wearing the life preserver? What's a life preserver? It preserves your life. It's a savior. All right, stay with me here. McFly walks in. He sits at the bar next to Marty, Marty, his future son. And then Biff walks in. This voice of intimidation comes to him. He's like, McFly, McFly, hitting him on the head, intimidating him. He's like, oh, you know, they know the thing. And then immediately, Marty, who's sitting next to him, the Savior, pipes up with another voice. And they start kind of poking at him like, hey, what's up with the life preserver? And so you see the beginning of these, this wrestle between these two voices, this voice of intimidation and this voice of the life preserver. The life preserver is trying to encourage him and strengthen him into his future and his destiny. And the other one is trying to intimidate him and keeping him from his future and his destiny. And so throughout the movie, Marty keeps chasing his father around. He's like, would you leave me alone? This voice of like faith and encouragement because he's trying to encourage him to then go after his future wife. But he's afraid, he's insecure, but this voice of encouragement keeps coming to him. But the more that he begins to respond in fear, you saw the picture of their future begins to be wiped out, wiped away. And it kind of culminates where they kind of scheme up this plan where McFly has to, to rescue his future wife Lorraine from Biff, right? Biff's in the vehicle trying to kiss her, all the stuff he walks up to her and he's like, get your hands off of her. He's kind of re rehearsed it. And Biff gets out of there and just starts to intimidate him again. So Biff is in a vehicle, right? Now, if Biff is the voice of intimidation in this vehicle, where's Marty, the voice, the voice of faith and courage? The scene cuts and he's in another vehicle, but he's trapped in a trunk. The voice of faith and encouragement is trapped in this trunk of a car. And there's these African-American musicians that are standing there. And these musicians pop him out of the trunk. And when he gets out of the trunk, he actually had the keys. And he goes, hey, these keys are yours. So think about it. The musicians were able to unlock this voice of faith out of this vehicle. And when, he, when Marty runs into the scene where his dad is with Biff, all of a sudden he has the courage to then, boom, knock out Biff, which alters his entire future. So you have these two voices in these vehicles. What is, what, is, what is a word? A word is a vehicle that carries spirit. Life and death are in the power of the tongue, right? And so the, the filmmaker is trying to make a point with these vehicles. There's these two voices that wrestle for your life. And if you still don't believe me, at the end of the film, when Marty goes back to the future, he crashes into this marquee, and the marquee says, Jesus saves, salvation is from God, church of God. He who has ears to hear, let him hear, Jesus would say as he told parables to the masses. There's something about that film that everybody relates to, right? Because it's a kingdom principle film. It's a, it's a Jesus film, but nobody sees it because it's baked, but the kingdom is baked into it. And I feel like that's, that's the hour we are in. What voice are we listening to? Are we listening to that voice of intimidation, that biff that's gonna try to make us shrink back? Or is there that other voice that we unlock through worship, through those worshipers that allow us to hear the voice of faith that give us the courage to get onto the field, to step in to our promises that help us to take down our Goliaths? 
So, all right, let me get into the Bible version of this story. We're going to look at a story that you guys know all too well, and I want you to look at it with fresh eyes today. You guys cool with that? We're looking at uh, the old David and Goliath story, 1 Samuel 17, if you'll go there. All right, I got 12 minutes. I got to go fast. If I can find it in my Bible. All right. So I want us to look at this with prophetic eyes, okay, and how this would relate to your life. So we're going to look at it prophetically. So it begins, it says, Now the Philistines gathered their armies for battle, and they were gathered at Soko, which belongs to Judah, and it camped between Soko and Azekah and Ephes Demim. All right, sounds like a bunch of jumbo, mumble jumbo here, but this is actually really deep. Um, Philistine... Philistine means stranger or alien or foreigner, okay? Um, Judah means what? Praise, right? Soko means hedge, and Azekah means broken down. So think about this. So the Philistines are this enemy army, this stranger foreign army coming into the land of Israel. The first place they come is into the place of Judah or the place of praise, Okay, so the praise, it says, is this hedge, but they're breaking it down and stepping into this place. And so what is praise? Praise is the vehicle by which we magnify the Lord, right? It's how we magnify him. And why do you need to magnify something? You need to magnify it because you can't see it very clearly, right? We've been in a season where something that you cannot see You've been made aware of 24 hours a day, seven days a week. There's been something that's been magnified in your midst that's not God, but you're totally aware of it all the time. So when the enemy steps into your, when he's trying to advance into your life, he steps into the place of your praise and he begins to magnify himself and saying, hey, look at how big I am. And so what you see, the the, the next text, you see something that's unprecedented in Scripture. You see this description of the enemy that goes into great detail. I think the Lord is saying, pay attention to this. Check it out. Starting in verse, uh, let's go to verse four. And it says, there came out from the camp of the Philistines a champion named Goliath of Gath, whose weight was six cubits in a span. He had a helmet of bronze on his head. And he was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze. And you're just supposed to read this with a British accent. (laughs) And he had a bronze armor on his legs and a javelin of bronze slung between his shoulders. And the shaft of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron. And his shield bearer went before him. He stood and shouted the ranks of Israel, Why have you come up to draw up for battle? Am I not a Philistine? And are you not just the servants of Saul? And so there's this big detailed description of how big this enemy is. Because he stepped into their place of praise and he's dominating. Right? And then it begins to hit right at their identity. Who are you? Just these servants of Jesus? You're just just mere servants. Verse 11 says, when Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. So this voice of a stranger comes into the place of praise, releases fear amongst the entire nation, and they were sidelined, unable to move forward. Right? So what about David? How does David, how does David deal with fear? You ever thought about that? Go to Psalm 34. If you'll put that up. Can you start at verse one? Or do you have to, does it take a while to load that in? Nope, you can't, or you know you can. Oh. I will bless the Lord at all times. How often? And his praise shall continually. How often? Continually be in my mouth. You ever thought about like, how do you do that? 
Well, we've been doing it for the coronavirus for the past year and a half. You've been doing it, whether you realize it or not. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. And let's exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he answered me and he delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant, their faces shall never be ashamed. So this is David, he's in a place of fear. We all get in fear, we all get intimidated. He says, come, let's magnify the Lord together, right? You guys know this, you guys are worshipers. This is like, this is one of like, this is like worship 101. And so David understands, this is David's dynamic, right? But Saul is the leader of Israel, he doesn't see this way. Saul's fear infects the entire nation as well. Because he didn't understand who, he didn't remember who he was. If you'll go with me to 1 Samuel 10. So Samuel, 1 Samuel 10, verse 5. Samuel uh, had just come to Saul because the people wanted a king. And they said, Saul prophesied, Samuel prophesied to him and says, you're going to be the king of Israel. And he says, as a sign of this, when you come, verse five, it says, you're gonna come to where there's a garrison of the Philistines. You're gonna come right to the enemy's camp. And there, as soon as, as, soon as you come to that city, you'll meet a group of prophets coming down from a high place with a harp, a tambourine, and flute, and lyre before them prophesying. So you got these crazy worshipers right in the middle of the enemy's camp, worshiping and prophesying and singing, and it says, then the spirit of the Lord was going to rush upon you and you will prophesy with them and be turned into another man. When these signs meet you, do all that your hand finds to do for God is with you. In verse nine, it says, when he turns back to leave Samuel, God gave him another heart. So you have this man who'd been transformed by the spirit of God. He'd been given a new heart, right? Saul had been transformed. Later on in the chapter becomes the seminal moment in Saul's life where Samuel wants to present him before the nation of Israel. This is his moment. He had just been transformed. Samuel's going to present him before the people as their leader, right? And as they do in verse 22, it says, so they inquired of the Lord again. and go, is there a man still to come? They're like, where is Saul? Where did he go? Because he's supposed to be here. We're supposed to be doing this massive presentation. And they say, behold, He's hidden himself among the baggage, right? Think about that. The man who'd just been transformed, it's his seminal moment to be presented before the nation, and he's hiding down amongst the baggage. Is that kind of bizarre? Do you ever think about like the seminal moments that present themselves in your life and the things that we hide behind from our past? Like I, maybe I messed up those other two times before. I might mess up again. Or I was betrayed in that last season. I don't know if I can trust again. Or whatever the thing is that we try to pull in front of us and we begin to look at our future through the lens of that baggage of our past, right? We all do it, right? If we're honest, we all do it. I believe that's the, that's the voice of the stranger coming in to magnify all these other things from your past. You know what Jesus said about the voice of a stranger? He said, my sheep know my voice and the voice of a stranger they will not listen to. Right? And so you have this contrasting dynamic between the leadership of Saul and then, the, and then David as David steps onto the scene. Let's go back to 1 Samuel 17. When David's, David's, you know, his job is to come bring food to his brothers. When he comes onto the scene, verse 22, well, verse 21 says, Israel and the Philistines drew up for battle, army against army. And it says, David left the things in the charge of the keeper of the baggage and ran to the ranks and went to greet his brothers. So immediately as David steps onto the scene in the seminal moment of his life, he leaves his things with the keeper of the baggage. 
Who's the keeper of your baggage? His name is Jesus. Jesus is the keeper of our baggage. Like all those things from our past, all those weights we are not meant to carry. He carried them upon the cross for us. So there's this divine exchange that takes place. I got two and a half minutes left. Huh? I got so much in here. I'm trying to figure out what's the quickest, what's this quickest way to exit. Um, man. Lord, I thank you for, uh, I thank you for the cross. I thank you for the cross that causes us to have this divine exchange where we can lay down our baggage from our past and we can step into the fullness of what you've called us to. I thank you, Lord, that this is a season where you're calling us to step onto the field like David, to lay, not look at our life from past seasons, but to magnify you to see you for who you truly are, to listen to the voice of the Savior. And you know, as as David steps onto the scene and he lays down his baggage, his brothers come against him, but then he goes to Saul, and Saul, he just starts to release faith. He says, "Do do you know what I've done in the past? I've defeated a lion, I've defeated a bear because God has been with me. And he starts to stoke his faith for what God has done in his life in the past. And his faith was so infectious, it infects the leader Saul to where Saul goes, go. You fight him. Could you imagine having such faith that you infect the leader of a nation to be able to go defeat this great giant? And so what is David's strategy to go defeat the giant? He immediately goes to get in the river. He gets in the river of God. He gets in the river. I believe this river is this place of worship. And he grabs these stones. He grabs these words of God. He gets these words of faith. And he's able to step right onto the field and sling them right towards that voice of a stranger to silence that thing. That voice of intimidation that's trying to keep the people of God from moving forward. And I believe we are in one of those seasons, body of Christ, that God, that that our Father is calling us to step into that place as pioneers again. To step into this place of legacy to step into this place of radical forgiveness, of letting go of our baggage of the past, to maybe even forgiving ourselves from the failures that we might have had, and that maybe we might believe that our latter years would be greater than our former years. And that the next 25 years, that the first 25 maybe is just the beginning of what God has for us. And so I know that we are really short on time, but I want us to do something real quick. I wanna pray for you guys. If you feel like God is calling you in this season to pioneer into a new place, into something new, in a radical way, would you step forward? Would you, would you stand up? That's what I'm talking about, Ohio, you pioneers. Father, I just pray for this group right here, for these pioneers. Lord, I pray that you would silence the mouth of the enemy. You'd silence the voice of that stranger that comes into their midst to intimidate them, to get them to shrink back, to get them to forget who they are, that knocks like McFly, McFly. But we say no to that voice in the name of Jesus. And we step into the place of the Spirit through worship and we begin to listen to the voice of our Savior, that life preserver, that would give us the courage to step into our legacy. Lord, I thank you that you have legacy, that you have promise for us, that you've made us to be those who slay giants. Whether it's the giants of forgiveness, whether it's the giants of betrayal, whether it's the giants of failure, whether it's the giants of business, business growth, whether it's the giants of marriage, whether it's the giants of your sexuality, whatever the giants of drug addiction, depression, suicide, whatever the giants are, Lord, that you will give us that word to hold on to in this season, to throw right at the head of the enemy's voice, so that thing will be cut off in Jesus' mighty name. In Jesus' mighty name.